everybody. Lord God Almighty, we thank you. Beautiful day. Beautiful Savior. Our desire here is to sing our praises to you, to offer you a sacrifice of praise, a sacrifice of thanksgiving, to enthrone you. You're King of all kings, Lord of all lords, and we're so grateful that we can come here together and play and sing and hear your word fellowship. You are so good. You're so good. Please give us a glimpse of your goodness today, your glory, your presence, your majesty, your power. Lord God, have your way in us. In Jesus' name, amen.
sing forever of your love come down with my hands to heaven shout your praises loud i was lost in darkness when you pulled me out i will sing forever of your love start again i will sing forever of your love come down with my hands to heaven shout your praises loud i was lost in darkness when you pulled me out I will sing forever of your love come down. Oh, oh. Jesus, rescue me. I will sing forever of your love. Come down with my hands to heaven. Shout your praises now. I was lost in darkness. Heard you pour me out. I will sing forever of your love. Come down. Grace so sweet. Now grace so sweet. It floods my soul. Hope eternal. Sing forever when your love comes down. 
King would die for me. 
It's my joy to honor you in all I do. Let me honor you. What a joy it is to be in your presence, Lord, with my brothers and sisters on this Labor Day weekend, Sunday morning. What a, what a privilege it is to come before your throne of grace to give you praise and honor and worship you. You've done so much for us, Lord God. We're so grateful. Thank you for our worship team today, Lord God. Just continue to grace them and bless them and all our worship teams as they take us to the throne of grace that sets the stage to receive the Word of God. So, Lord, we look forward to what you're going to do in us and through us today. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen. I would say welcome to our live stream guests, but uh, we don't have them today because we had a computer crash. So, so we are work on that one, too, and uh, we'll get these glitches ironed out here sooner or later, but I think uh, in some respects we're experiencing spiritual interference, th those kinds of things, but that's okay. But it's us four and no more. <laughs> We've got you. That's important. Great to, great to be with you. And uh, we'd like to invite you to our, our September carry-in meal. Usually don't have as many people on the first Sunday of the month, because it's usually Labor Day weekend, or in the, that vicinity, and we have people camping and visiting Grandma, and uh, it's just that weekend, traditionally the last weekend of the summer, so people are enjoying that time, and rightly so, but we're going to enjoy it here this morning. We've got a lot to share with you, and there's just so much coming up, and uh, we want to share in communion in just a moment. 
But I want to share with you, uh, we were praying that uh, the Lord would help us to j- just pay off what we owed on the church facility by, by this fall. And I was kind of hoping that it would, be, it would be nice to have that paid off, you know, the month of August, our 40th year, as we celebrate our 40th year. Well, uh, just a couple days before the end of August, the funds came in to pay off our facility. So we're debt free. So, so we just like to praise the Lord for that. And uh, thank you for those of you who gave extra along the way to, to make that happen as well. Uh, we, we're, just, we're just so blessed. And uh, because this is the first time in my 40 year history church that we were not, uh, we're not, well, when we started out, we weren't at debt, and then we had to get facilities and rent facilities and all that kind of, anyway, we're debt free, so praise the Lord for that. Let's give the Lord another clap hand for that one. <laughs> you know how it feels when you pay off your house, and those of you who are still paying on your house, you know, oh, is it ever going to end? It will, just, just be faithful, it'll, it'll, it'll come, and... Uh, but it's just wonderful to have that. And uh, uh, I attribute that, of course, to God's faithfulness, but also to your faithful faithful giving over the years. And again, those of you who gave extra to make that, that happen. So God is, God is good. He's on, on the throne. Well, let's prepare our hearts for communion this morning. We want to go to the Lord and, and just remember all he's accomplished for us, especially the fact that we're here because of his death and the penalty that he he paid. So if you didn't get a a little emblem here, hold up your hands and the ushers will get that to you. Yes, we've got... Keep your hand lifted until you you get the wafer and and the juice... This is a time that, well, the Apostle Paul exhorts us in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 to, to examine one's self to make sure we're, we're in the faith. And if you know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, then we encourage you to, to share in this communion with the Lord and with, with the body. It's, a, it's just a, a refresher and a reminder of the pardon that Jesus purchased for us for forgiveness and eternal life, and that's why we're here. And it focuses on what he did for us in the past, but it also focuses on the future because on the night of Passover, he said, do this in remembrance me. As often as you eat the bread and drink of the cup, you proclaim his death until he comes. So that has a prophetic significance as well as a historical and a a relevant application to us today. So Lord, we we just want to thank you for the forgiveness that you've offered for us. And we just want to pause right now to thank you for that forgiveness, deliverance from our sins, and give you thanks, give you praise. We thank you, Lord God, that you sent your son to live that perfect life for us. We're so grateful for that. It's a life that you demanded. It's a life that we couldn't measure up to, but Jesus did. And that perfect life that you demanded for us was sacrificed for us. And so we remember his perfect life and sacrifice for us today as we eat of this little wafer in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus, for that perfect life, perfect life for us. You had each and every one of us in mind when you were living out that life. 
And that, that just blows our minds. It's just beyond our comprehension. But all we can do is say thank you. And then, Heavenly Father, we thank you for the cleansing blood of the Lord Jesus Christ that according to 1 John, perpetually cleansed us from all unrighteousness because we're in fellowship with you. We thank you for that initial pouring out of his blood, which took his life for us as he took our sins upon himself and washed us of our sins, past, present, and future. Again, phenomenal, unbelievable from the human perspective, but so needed And we're grateful for the cleansing blood of the Lord Jesus Christ as we drink together in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Thank you so much, Heavenly Father, for what your Son did for us. In Jesus' name, thank you. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Whom the Son has set free is free indeed. indeed. You're free. Jesus' name. Well, again, I'd like to invite you to stay after and share a meal with us. You say, well, I didn't bring anything. Well, don't let that stop you. We've got plenty of food. God is is blessed. We have plenty of food right now. I mean, food supplies are running out around the world and parts of our our country, but we have plenty of food right now, so let's eat it while we have it, right? Well, I'd like for you to turn in the book of Joel, the prophet Joel. It's in the Old Testament. And we've been doing a kind of a a survey of of the minor prophets and... So the minor prophets are after the major prophets of Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel. And they're called minor not because they're less significant. It's just because mostly they're less in content, except Daniel has only got 12 chapters and Zechariah and one of the other minor prophets have 14 chapters. But basically, they're less in content, but boy, they pack a wall up. They're just so good. And so you have uh, Daniel, Hosea, and then Joel. And so that's the prophet we're in. And I was just planning on doing a one or two week survey of, of Joel. And, and that's basically what we're coming down to. But I'm taking a, a chapter with There's only three chapters in Joel. And so we covered chapter one last week, chapter two today, chapter three next week. But I want to extend one more week. In two weeks, I want to focus in on, on oh, that's, that's the Bible being, being uh, proclaimed there. But Joel, his name means Yahweh is God. And not much is known about Joel, but his prophecy is known, and what he says in, in Acts is known because Peter quotes Joel in Acts chapter 2, and that's the section I want to take. Uh, Acts chapter, excuse me, jo, jo, uh, Joel chapter 2, verses 8 through 32 is quoted by the apostle Peter in Acts chapter 2. And so in a couple weeks, I want to take that, that text in Joel and see it in in light of Acts chapter 2 as well, because it really is significant to where we are today. We need the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives like never before, like like we did on the day of Pentecost. But Joel gives Israel hope for the future, but Peter takes that, applies it to the church on the day of Pentecost, and how we need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And I'm excited that Billy is and, and uh, Joe is starting their class next week, the adult Bible class, in the book of Acts. And I think Billy said he's going to be in the book of Acts until the rapture. Is that right? <laughs> <Amen>. <laughs> so 
So that'll be a thrilling uh, study, and I'm so happy that so many people are, are turning out for that uh, adult Bible class at 9 o'clock on, on Sunday mornings. I hear all kinds of great reports. So uh, Joel is called the prophet of Pentecost because of his words that he quotes, that uh, Peter quotes from him in, in the book of Acts. And uh, it's kind of the bright side of the day of the Lord, you might say. So I, I want to review where we came from, from last week. There's this plague of locusts that hit Judah, the southern kingdom. It was terrible, a horrible plague of locusts. And in chapter 1, verses 2 through 4, I want to read through 2 through 4. In fact, you might want to turn your Bibles to the book of Joel and just kind of follow along. I'm not going to read every single verse in Joel chapter 2, but I'm going to read a lot of them. But I want to look at verses 2 through 4 and zero in on verse 4. Hear this, ye elders. Give ear, all you inhabitants of the land. Has anything like this happened in your days or even the days of your fathers? Tell your children about it. Let your children tell their children and their children uh, another generation. Now, verse 4, what the the chewing locust left, the swarming locust has eaten. And what the swarming locust has left, the crawling locust has eaten. And what the crawling locust left, the consuming locust has eaten. Now, there's over 90 different kinds of locusts. Some of them are very large, three to four to five inches. Some are very small. Uh, One of the the phylum is like uh, grasshoppers, but they get much bigger than our American grasshoppers, and they can just destroy uh, real estate quick. So the theme of Joel is the day of the Lord, and Joel applies the day of the Lord to three periods of time. First, the immediate plague of locusts and the disastrous aftermath historically. Second, the historical invasion of Assyria. He equates these locusts with a a human army that invades uh, Judah. And then third, the future prophetic judgment that would come upon the whole world at the end of the age. And we'll look at that one next, next week. However, he intersperses the plague of locusts with both the intermediate and the ultimate invasion and judgment of God. So last week we saw the the historical day of of, of the Lord through these locusts. And uh, the focus in verses 2 through 4 was to the elders, and that's here and the citizens. In verses 5 through 7, they're told to wake up. The drunkards wake up. The drunkards have a tendency to sleep. Time for them to wake up. Wake up and realize their vineyards are gone. Their drink is done, so they're, they're in trouble. And then verses 8 through 10, we saw that, uh, the farmers are told to mourn. And then finally, there's a call to fast on the part of the priests, verse 13 through, through 20. Terrible, terrible plague. So... Joel uses the term day of the Lord five times in these three short chapters. And the day of the Lord is actually a technical term that demonstrates God's judgment in the context of Joel's prophecy. But you expand that out through the whole counsel, the word of God. The day of the Lord has a historical reference, but it's specifically related to the time after the rapture and includes the tribulation the second coming, the millennium, that's the bright side of the day of the Lord, and then the the, uh, creation of the new heavens and the uh, new earth with the destruction of the old heavens and and earth. So that's kind of a a panoramic view of of the day of the Lord. But basically, it's God's intervention in the the affairs of, of man, primarily through judgment, but also in the millennium, and that's that's the the bright side of of the day of the Lord. So, though the plague of locusts was literal and historical, it's also a preview of 
the coming intermediate judgment and invasion on the part of Assyria towards the southern kingdom of Judah. In chapter 2, Joel interweaves the plagues of locusts with the fabric of the Assyrian invasion that happened over a hundred years after Joel wrote this prophecy. And yet, the instruction that Joel gives is applied to the Assyrian invasion, and God honors his word, as we'll see. His principles are basically the same. What do you do when you're in trouble? Well, first of all, you repent. You make sure you're right with God, and you go straight to his heart, and you ask him for help. That's it in a nutshell. That's what Israel did when they did that. They had success. God blessed. And when they didn't, they were judged. The same thing can happen to individuals, and it can happen to a nation. So let's take a look at these, some of these verses in Joel chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. I want to read this. Blow the trumpet in Zion. Raise the alarm on my holy mountain. Let everyone tremble in fear because the day of the Lord is upon us. It's a day of darkness and gloom, a day of thick clouds and deep blackness. Suddenly, like dawn spreading across the mountains, a great and mighty army appears. Nothing like it has been seen before or will it ever be seen again. I just want to make three observations here on verse 2. First of all, here we observe how Joel interweaves the historic plague of locusts with the characteristics of future invasions, particularly those of the, of the tribulation period and, and the end time. We'll see that next week. But there have been many locust plagues throughout history, and we still have locust plagues. In fact, last year there was a, a major one in Ethiopia and parts of, of Africa. There was one in Pakistan that it was so thick that it blotted out the sun. You could not, it was dark because of this plague of locusts. And, of course, they destroy crops, which creates drought and then creates famine as a result. Finally, a huge wind came, like a tornado, and blew these plague of locusts out to sea, and they drowned. They washed up on shore... And the pile of locusts that was left was 50 miles long and four feet deep. Can you imagine that? But that's the kind of of plague we're talking about here in Joel chapter 1. And he he continually uses that as as the the preview of plagues that are coming in the future, both with military and demonic plagues. it's kind of interesting how locusts are associated with demons in, in Revelation chapter 9. And I'm sure everyone that's had a plague of locusts felt like they, they've been hit by a bunch of demons. So in verses, uh, chap- chapter 2, verses 3, and I want to read chapter 2, verse 3, and verses 6 and 7, it, it prefigures the Assyrian invasion, and some suggest also... Uh, a future invasion of a northern confederacy described in Ezekiel 38 and 39, led by Russia down to, uh, down to uh, uh, Israel. And it's kind of interesting how the three main players that are described in Ezekiel 38 are very prominent in news right now, Iran, Turkey, and, and, and Russia. So we'll have to see how that plays out. But... Uh, Uh, l- let me go back to verse 2 a second. I, I missed something here. He talked about a great army, great and mi- mighty army. It's probably prefiguring the Assyrian invasion. But then it says, nothing like it has been seen before or will ever be again. Now that changes the context a little bit because there have been worse plagues than locusts from Joel's period. And worse plagues of locusts, worse invasions as well. It kind of reflects on Daniel chapter 12, verse 1, and also that's quoted in Matthew chapter 24, verse 21. It says, For then there will be great tribulation such as not occurred since the beginning of the world until now, 
nor ever will again. In other words, that's the last one. It's the, it's the big kahuna. It's so huge. Nothing like it will ever happen again. So that's a projection in, into the future. But when we look at uh, chapter 2, verse 3, I want to read verse 3 and then verses 6 and 7. Fire burns in front of them and flames follow after them. Ahead of them lies the land as beautiful as the Garden of Eden. Behind them is nothing but desolation. Now, the land of, of Israel was like a Garden of Eden. It is especially now that the desert is blossom, but we'll deal with Israel next week, uh, where we are today. But when Assyria was uh, invading the southern kingdom, they had already destroyed the northern kingdom and, and took them captive. They were marching towards Jerusalem, and they destroyed everything in its path. But the land of Israel and Jerusalem was like an oasis. And so it's a reference there to the Garden of Eden. No one escapes. Verse 6 says, fear grips all the people. Every face grows pale with terror. The attackers march like warriors and scale the city walls like soldiers. That's exactly what uh, Assyria did. And they, they swarm over the walls. Verse 10, the earth quakes as they advance and the heavens tremble. That's not necessarily something that happens in a locust plague, but that's certainly something that happens with uh, uh, apocalyptic events, uh, earthquakes, heavens trembling. The sun and moon grow dark and the stars no longer shine. That happens in plagues of locusts where you, everything's just blotted out the light. But this has a reference to future because it's, the signs are very similar to what's described just before Christ comes in his second coming, right towards the end of the tribulation. Then there's the call to repentance. So they, they're seeing this plague of locusts, and then they're, they're, they're being threatened by Assyria as well. So in verses 12 through 17, there's a call to repentance. And I want to read a few of these verses here. And this answers the question, can anything be done? It looks like we're hopeless, we're defenseless against this plague of locusts, historically, against the Assyrian invasion, which destroyed all armies before it and all kingdoms before it. And only Judah is standing in its way. So verse 12 says, this is why the Lord says, turn to me now while there is time. Turn to me now while there is time. It's like Right in this middle of the plague of locusts, and then historically, you move it up 100 years, here comes Assyria. We're dead meat. They're too powerful for us. What can we do? Well, the Lord says, that's why the Lord says, turn to me now while there's still time. And it's the same principle that he's, he's given throughout the scripture. Uh, have any of you heard I got my cheat sheets here from a previous sermon I preached. Have ever, any of you ever heard of 2 Chronicles 7.14? Some people say, well, that, that, that's just to Israel. It has nothing to do with the church. Yeah, okay, well, fine. But in principle and application, I can find dozens of other verses that say the same thing to the believer in Christ in the New Testament. And it says this. If my people, well, his people, of course, were Israel and Judah in, in, historically. Today, it's his bride, the church. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, pray, seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, will forgive their sin, and will heal their land. Well, that's a good one. But here's even a, I'm not, not a better one, but another one that's really good. Jeremiah chapter 18. Verse 11, and also verse 7. Now, this not only relates to Israel and Judah, this relates to all nations. That's why there's a possibility that this could apply to America. The instant I speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom. Now, this is Jeremiah chapter 18, verses 7. 
verses 11, 7 through 11, excuse me. So the instant I speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom to pluck up, to pull down, and to destroy it, if that nation, what nation? Any nation, Israel, Judah, Japan, America, parts of Europe, If that nation whom I have spoken turns from its evil, I will relent of the disaster that I thought to bring upon it. Verse 9. And the instant I speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom to build and to plant it, if it does evil in my sight so that it does not obey my voice, then I will relent concerning the good which I said I would benefit it. So that's a general principle. Any nation? If I've got some good plan and you turn, judgment may come. But if judgment comes and you turn, I may relent. I just may have mercy on you. But then he goes on to verse 11. He says, Now therefore speak to the men of Judah and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and to America, Thus says the Lord, Behold, I am fashioning a disaster and devising a plan against you. Return now every one of you from his evil way and make your ways and your doings good. So again, even in the midst of fashioning, well, Nineveh, you know, the judgment that was coming on Nineveh, Nineveh, 40 days are toast. God sends the reluctant prophet Jonah, and he says, You're toast. They repent, and from the king on down. So there's historical exhortations and historical illustrations of how God has applied his word to, to judgments and invasions and so forth. Now, the same thing has happened to Israel in their history. When they haven't returned, then they experience the judgment. So he goes on here in chapter 2, verse 13, don't, don't tear your clothing in grief, but tear your hearts instead. In other words, don't go through religious rituals. Just don't fire up prayers and go your own way. This is a heart thing. I think America is, is at a point where we're at a heart thing, as I'll share with you in just a moment. Verse 14, who knows? Perhaps he will give you a reprieve, sending you a blessing instead of a curse. Perhaps you will be able to offer a grain and wine offering to the Lord your God as he blessed before. Well, we know historically that happened. Uh, Joel's generation, they did repent. God did relent and restored their, their crops uh, and had mercy upon them. And uh, he stopped the speck, the play, and he restored what was lost. But then, again, in this context, verse 15, blow a trumpet in Zion. Now, this is the second time he gives this warning. Now, the first time you hear a, a, a trumpet warning, you really need to take note. But when he says, he blows that trumpet a second time, this is serious. And I think so many times we think, ah, well, you know, we think seen things worse before and uh, it'll get better. Yeah, we'll just elect a new president or a new, uh, new congressman and senators and it'll get better. No, not now, not now. It's too serious. And, and this is why this passage applies so much. Blow a trumpet in Zion, consecrate a fast, call the people together for a solemn meeting. I mean, gather all the people, uh, the elders, the children, even the babies. And it really gets serious. When you call the bridegroom from his quarters and the bride from her private room, this means this is urgent. Stop your honeymoon. Your honeymoon's over. It's, it's being curtailed. Those of you who are on your honeymoon, you, you didn't want to be interrupted, did you? Nobody wants to be interrupted on their honeymoon. But the Lord says, we're interrupting this honeymoon because this is very, very serious. 
Let the priest who ministered, verse 17, in the Lord's presence stand and weep between the entry room to the temple and the altar. And then, verse 17, Joel tells them how to pray. So we don't have to guess even how to pray. The scripture gives us instruction on how to pray. Let them pray. Spare your people, Lord. Don't let your special possession become an object of mockery. Don't let them become a joke for the unbelieving foreigners who say, has God abandoned Israel? Has God abandoned Israel? Has he abandoned any particular nation who he's, he's shed his grace on? Well, last week we saw that God heard the prayers of his people. He's going to hear the prayers of his people again a hundred years later when Assyria invades Judah. The Assyrian kingdom just overwhelmed the northern kingdom, took them cap captive, as, as we said, destroyed them. They ceased to exist. And then they focused on the southern kingdom of Judah. And they had most of it. And they were at the gates of Jerusalem. The Assyrian army was led by Sennacherib, and he just crushed every nation before it, before them. So King Hezekiah sees this, and he had been praying, but boy, he takes a threatening letter before the Lord. He bows down before God, and he pours out his heart. And he says a prayer very similar to what Joel prescribes here that we just read. And if you want to read his prayer, you can read it in 2 Kings chapter 19, verses 14 through 17. And as a result, God sent Sennacherib packing. He also crushed his army when they were ready to conquer Jerusalem by sending an angel and destroyed 185,000 of his military. One night, one angel... That's what God can do in response to prayer. And then Sennacherib goes home and was killed in the house of his gods. That was the end of the Assyrian Empire. Then Babylon comes on the scene. But it's, it's really interesting how the play on words with, with the plague of locusts and how it's interwoven with the, the Assyrian invasion and ultimately the Babylonian invasion and the invasion in the future from, from the north, from Russia, and ultimately the Antichrist. We'll get into more details on that next week. But historically, it's just fantastic. God will do what he said he will do if his people will do what they're supposed to do. So the king of Assyria and his leaders, they mocked God, they blasphemed God, they ridiculed their leader, Hezekiah, and the prophet Isaiah just mocking them. God heard that. But, you know, it sounds very similar to what some of the leaders of the World Economic Forum and the global elites are saying about what they want to accomplish. In their arrogance, they have no room for God, no room for Christ, no room for Christianity, no room for a constitutional republic based upon the Bible. No room for babies in the womb. They're full of hatred, and they're bent on accomplishing their agenda and their purpose, including the collapse of our economy, including controlling all health care, uh, including depopulating the planet, uh, I read this yesterday, actually, early this morning. I thought, oh, this is hard to believe. But I'm going to read it for you. This is from Dr. McCullough, who uh, just a fantastic doctor. He stays up with all the health issues and so on. Anyway, he says, insurance companies report a 40% increase in excess mortality among working age adults during the fourth quarter of 2021. Now, that's just the fourth quarter of 2021. Not even a 
2022. Millennial ages 25 to 44 had an 84% increase in excess of mortality in that same time frame. That means they died. In fact, almost 400,000 millennials died mysteriously. That some, they, they don't, they're not saying they know, but they're not saying why they died, and more are, continue to die. And then... Uh, And the number of Americans claiming to be disabled now, those claims have risen uh, at least 10%. So it's like, yeah, okay, here, here are these, these arrogant elitists who think that they have the future in the palm of their hands have caused people to fear. But in reality, the people who need to fear are not you and me, not believers especially. But the people who near, need to really fear right now, because they're on real, real thin ice, are the tyrants, the Marxist progressives, the people who hate babies, who hate Christians, who hate this constitutional republic. They're the ones that need to fear because they're on notice from Almighty God. They're about to be judged. And we pray that they would repent. It's not too late. But in their arrogance and their stubbornness and their de demonic haze that they're in, it's going to take a lot of praying. It can happen. We're praying. But their time is running out. So it's not us who need to fear. It's them who need to fear God because he's going to have this final say in all of this. That's why we pray for everyone. Everyone is within the sphere of the grace of God, and we pray that they see the light while there is still time. Well, verses 18 through 27 describes the promise of restoration, which happened, and I'm not going to read all these verses, but verse 18 says, Then the Lord will pity his people and jealously guard the honor of his land, the Lord will reply, look, I am sending you grain and new wine and olive oil, enough to satisfy your needs. You will no longer be an object of mockery. I will drive away these armies from the north, and I will send them to the parched wastelands. Those in front will be driven into the Dead Sea, those at the rear to the Mediterranean Sea. The stench of their rotting bodies will Rise over the land. And that has both historical and prophetic significance. But then he says, verse 21, Don't be afraid, O land. Be glad and rejoice. Then on down to verse 26, Once again, you will have all the food you want, and you will praise your God, who does these miracles for you. Never again will my people be dis disgraced. And of course, that relates to Israel in, in the future. So here we are, and the tremendous application for us and for the church, and I think we really need to take prayer seriously. We, we've been talking about that for some time, and pray what the scriptures have already predetermined that God wants to do. I love these verses, and I, I, I pray these. Uh, verse Psalm 33:10, Lord, bring the counsel of the heathen to nothing, uh, make the devices of these people of no effect. Isaiah 8.18, devise your strategy, but it will be thwarted. Propose your plan, but it will not stand, for God is with us. Mark Hitchcock said, the plans that the uh, World Economic Forum have are, are plans that are just outline the tribulation. So they're planning the tribulation. The problem is, and you've heard me say before, it's not time for the tribulation yet. We're still here. The church is still here. The tribulation is not going to happen until, and, until the church is out of here. However, we've already seen the shadows of their plan 
implemented. And we see some tough things. So a lot of things are going on here. We're living in the vicinity of the rapture church. So if that's not enough to motivate us to, to get our hearts in tune with the Lord and, and, and share Christ with our loved ones, co-workers, fellow students, boy, we've got nothing to lose and everything to gain right now. I don't want anybody to be left behind during the, for, the, for the tribulation. Verse 21, verse 11, listen to this one. Though they plot evil against you and devise wicked schemes, they cannot succeed. We have the privilege of praying that. The Holman Standard translation on this verse says, though they intend to harm you and devise wicked, a wicked plan, they will not prevail. And of course, that bread and butter verse that we pray, Psalm 140, verse 8, do not grant, O God, the desires of the wicked, do not promote his evil, that they may not be exalted. The World Economic Forum and the globalists and certain elitists in our own government wanted to be further down the road than, when they, than they are now. They were hoping that, that COVID would take out a lot more people than it did, but it didn't. Why not? Because you and I are here, because people are praying, that's why. They can't fulfill all they want to do with you and I here. We're praying. They have to get through God first, and well, even though they mock him, they have to deal with him. Isn't that cool? Atheists and agnostics and cynics and skeptics, they can mock all they want, but they still have to contend with God, don't they? I wonder why they spend so much money on trying to prove that there's no God if there's no God, right? <laughs> Lord, we love you, and we thank you. You're in control. It gives us hope. Every time we pick up the word, every time we hear something like this, Lord God, to inspire, encourage us to press on and go on. If God be for us, who can be against us? And I believe that you are for your bride. I know there's some ornery things going on in the body of Christ that need, need to be sh shaped up and repented of. And uh, there are certain areas of the church that need to come back online and start preaching the word of God instead of philosophy and psychology and, and things that really don't help people in the long run. But your word does. You, you, you promised that your word would not come back void and so that's why we teach it and preach it and believe it and see it, the outworking of it in people's lives. So you're the one that brings joy and peace in the midst of all kinds of things. And Lord, this has been a tough year for a lot of us. But Lord, we're still standing. We're still pressing on. We're still loving you. We're still praising you. We still are extremely optimistic of, that you're in control. And we believe the best is yet to come for your bride, your church. Not only the rapture could happen anytime, but I believe we're going to see tens of thousands, if not millions of people come to Christ in, uh, during this time. So, as you said, we must work the works while it is yet day, and it's still day, but we see the night coming when no man can work. During the tribulation, we won't be here to work, but we've got the opportunities now, and so... Energize us anew and afresh, Lord God. Send your power from on high. Send your Holy Spirit, Father, to fill us anew and afresh and to heal our bodies, heal our temples, and strengthen us with your power in these exciting days in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. amen. Would you uh, stand with me, please? I'm going to ask Steve to come on back up. And if you need prayer for anything, for yourself, for your family member, a loved one, a neighbor, we want to invite you to come and let our prayer team pray for you. We might need an extra prayer warrior or two because we've got some that are out of town. I think we've got some good people here. We're going to close... Uh, with this
time of prayer. And again, if you need prayer, come. We'll, we'll close with this. But we invite you to come and, and eat with us afterwards if you can stay. So we love you. Best is you to come for each and every one of you. In Jesus. Thank you.